and welcome back. So our first video was just about exclusively spent going through Midgar, step by step. We didn't have much of a choice because all of that stuff just had to be covered. So well, what did I think of the whole Midgar thing? Because I didn't even really get much of a chance to offer my own opinion all that much after all. Now I may as well just come out with it straight away. Midgar is fantastic, and one of the best realised starts to any game ever. There's plenty of good stuff to come, but Midgar remains one of the game's more memorable parts. For some players of the game, well, nothing else even comes close to Midgar. It's easy to see why people would think that, as Midgar is virtually a game and story all on its own. It has a three-act structure, a wise, fall and Lena wise with a twist. It even corresponds to the traditional plot structure of a movie. For a fun experiment, why don't you try looking up Blake Snyder's 15-point beat sheet system for writing a Hollywood movie and seeing how Midgar fits into that. I'm showing you what I came up with right now, and I have to say that it does fit into that system a hell of a lot better than most games do. As an introduction, Midgar takes some beating, although it is sort of different from what comes next. The breakneck pace necessitates the running of a very tight ship. Everything about Midgar is completely and totally linear, with almost no deviation from the main path. This is quite a marked difference from what comes when you get to the world map. Although the game's never much of a free roamer, the map does allow you to take the story at your own pace a little bit more, and everything does become slower. This is necessary, of course. There's absolutely no way the game could have sustained the pace set here, although I could see why people would be annoyed at the sudden change in tempo. It doesn't help that Midgar is followed by what has to be one of the slowest sections of the whole game, I guess, but we'll be getting to that later. Perhaps a comparison could be made between Midgar and the tanker part of Metal Gear Solid 2. Both are extremely tight sequences with not an ounce of fat on them, taking place at ridiculous speed, and neither totally prepares you for the rest of the game, which is a bit slower and a bit more meandering, but also a lot more open to your input. I'd also argue that Midgar is one of the many reasons why it would be virtually impossible to do a full modern remake of FF7, because it is very much of its time. Midgar wouldn't have existed without PS1 era technology. No massive abundance of long cutscenes, realistic faces, full voice acting, multi-million dollar budgets. The lack of technology allowed for much quicker stories. Nowadays, I almost feel like it would be necessary to give everything the AAA treatment, and think of just how condensed Midgar is. I mean, you'd need to expand it. Midgar is a whole RPG story condensed into five or so hours of gameplay. If you tried to remake it, I think the temptation would be almost too high to expand it crazily, to the point where it would virtually have to be a full game on its own. And to think that this is just the start of disc 1, and we still have all of that and two more discs to boot, <laughs> there's a long, long way to go yet. It's a bold move to start the game with something as inch-perfect as Midgar, and it's a testament to FF7's ultimate quality that the game actually does manage to pull off such an insane act of front-loading in such an important title. Ok, so with that done, we can now start looking at some characters, and perhaps doing them the justice that this game has done to them rather than, well, whatever is in the movies and all that. We'll start by looking at our four mains. We've literally only just been introduced to Red 13, so we're going to save him for another time. For now, we'll start with what we know so far about our main hero, good old Cloud Strife. Now, what do people usually say about Cloud? They normally say that he's kind of a sullen, emo sort of character, don't they? That he's rather humourless, pretty plain, and that, frankly, he doesn't have much of a character at all? But then the first part of FF7 kinda goes against all of that. In the beginning, Cloud is presented as the undoubted hero, the most capable guy in the womb. This differs so much from most RPG stories. You're so used to seeing the hero have to learn everything basically from scratch in the classic Luke Skywalker, Frodo Baggins tradition. All they know is that they're the chosen one, and they're gonna have to struggle to live up to that billing. Cloud, on the other hand, in the beginning of FF7, starts out as utterly capable. There's a sense that Avalanche wouldn't be doing half the shit they'd be doing if it wasn't for Cloud's presence, and Cloud sure as hell knows it. He flat out says that if any of his ex-cohorts from Soldier had turned up on the first React one, Avalanche would have been torn apart. This belief naturally brings him into conflict with Barrett, who Cloud almost treats with disdain in the beginning. 
Cloud appears regretful at times that he's not in Soldier anymore, and he considers Bout to be a big fish in a small pond, aware that he kind of is too. He's certainly not afraid to stand up to Barrett, and throughout Midgar there's a pretty constant conflict as both try to assert their positions in order to be the leader. It cools down a little as Midgar reaches its climax, but there's a definite sense that, well, they wouldn't ordinarily be friendly with each other. Cloud's brash ways seem to almost come naturally to him, whereas Barrett ends up trying to force his position more and more. Still, if Barrett is just hot air, his relationship with the other main characters is a little more protective, needlessly so almost, especially in the case of Cloud and Iris. Still, it's Cloud who's always trying to take the lead, as he usually does. He's just a little bit smarter about it. Teeth was kinda more an equal, it seems, even though we still don't know an awful lot about their relationship aside from them being childhood friends. There's almost something unspoken there that's gonna become clearer as we continue. Um, one other thing that's usually claimed against Cloud is that he's a rather passive hero, he doesn't direct the plot, other people do. Again, this isn't the impression we get from the actual game. Cloud actually drives the plot forward more than anyone. He's always asking the most relevant questions, directing the group to where they should go next, and, in the most crucial moment of all, he knows exactly what Sephiroth's return means, and he immediately gets the group on board with that. Of course, the return of Sephiroth also fits into the one flaw he does have, all those sudden flashbacks. They serve a purpose throughout Midgar by revealing flaws we can't yet fully make out. If Cloud was merely just a brash, cocky ex-soldier, it would still be kinda dull. But we can see there's something else bubbling under. And of course, that's a story for another part entirely. He's still the best there is as far as the party goes. When he's chosen to lead at the end of Midgar, it's not really anything passive, he doesn't ask for it, but honestly, at that point, with the way the story's turned, there's no other choice except Cloud. The question is, where does this more negative picture of Cloud come from? I mean, to be honest, a lot of it is probably Square's fault. Cloud's character has tended to become simplified as the FF7 universe expanded to include things like films, cameos, and indeed other games. Some of it is possibly a bit more necessary if you look at a prologue game like Crisis Core, whereas others are less so. I mean, how he appears in something like Advent Children, let's say, doesn't really fit into the character we know from this game. He is a bit more, well, emo. It could also be that after FF7, Square managed to gain kind of a reputation of writing more passive, sullen leads in their games, starting with Squall from FF8. And although Cloud doesn't quite fit into that, he almost gets lumbered in just by association. Perhaps this is all just a projection, but I always have the impression that Cloud is a lot stronger than most people believe him to be. And of course, he does have a massive character arc. This character is going to completely change by the time we get to the finish. But that's a story for another video. Right, so let's take a break from character analysis and switch to some gameplay. We've barely looked at the actual battle system, you know, and while it's not incredibly complex or anything, it's still something we spend a crap of a lot of time doing. So let's do it. First off, let's not mince words. In general, FF7 is a pretty easy game. There are occasional difficult moments along the way, but there's nothing that's too troubling. The amount of side quests there are usually means that you can get through the game without ever having to spend hours or so grinding or anything like that. You can develop skills naturally. So FF7's battle system caters for various styles, and it can be kinda repetitive, if you want it to be. If you choose to roll with nothing except physical attacks, then you won't usually have much trouble with any fights in the game. You can just press attack all day long and be done with it. Still, it's more fun to play around with the magic as the materia system is great. It differs from previous FF games, particularly FF6, in that it makes magic open to you at pretty much all times, which again makes it quite easy. But it's pretty awesome to screw around with. There's all the elements you could want, fire, ice, lightning, all that, strengths and weaknesses, tons of healing spells, a whole bunch of weird status effect finimajigs, all the fancy summons with their big animations and whatnot, hunting down the enemy skills, different commands. Materia adds so much to the game no matter how you're playing it, whether you're going for all out magic or just smashing folks to smithereens. We'll probably need to do another bit on Materia later on, because so far we've barely seen any of the really cool stuff we can do with it. But so far we've already seen how it can be used to add the ability to steal shit from enemies, thus gaining cool items. 
You can also use a cover materia so that someone else takes damage aside from the person the enemy targets. And you know, so much more. We haven't even scratched the surface. And of course, there's limits. What happens when one of your party takes a bit too much damage and decides they've had enough of that shit? Usually this takes the form of one big massive attack, but some things are more unique. Tifa's Beat Rush, for example, which takes the form of a slot machine and means that every limit you earn with her is another chain in a combo. Some characters' limits also allow you to kind of break the game a little, especially Iris's ones. Iris is, as you might guess, our white mage character, and her very first limit heals the party. The game kind of tells you that she's useless in combat and recommends that you put her in the back row so she doesn't get hurt so much. Well, you should ignore that. Stick her in the front. Help put that cover material on her too, and then give her a hyper so she goes into fury mode and her limit bar goes up faster. And what do you know, hey presto, so long as Iris is in your party and you've got this limit, you're virtually immortal. Enemies can't damage you enough to kill the party before Iris cures the shit out of everyone with the healing wit. Nice, sir. Make no mistake, Iris kicks ass. We're going to be using her a lot. Now that's just one example of how you can break this game. It's not a super breakable game, and it's not even all that necessary to break it, but the system gives you a lot of freedom to just have fun with it and play with whatever style you want, which is quite cool. There's still lots of stuff we haven't seen yet, and we're going to be looking at it a bit more in future analysis videos. For now, we have to look at another one of FF7's core characters. He's an insurgent, he's not a bit nervous, he's Barrett Wallace. And at the start of the game, he's kind of the de facto leader. He won Avalanche, he's got the biggest commitment to taking down Shinra, he wants to save the planet, whereas Cloud is kinda just in it for the greenbacks. And so he tends to get kinda pissy whenever Cloud reminds him that he's not quite as big as he thinks he is, meaning that he gets hot-headed. Quite a lot, actually. Uh, so, yeah, Barrett is kinda controversial. There's several ways of looking at him. There's the almost apologetic way of looking at him, saying that the game's of its time and this is how Japanese folks see westerners and all that stuff. Or you can just flat out say that Barrett is a big fat stereotype of a big fat angry black man. Now I tend to fly somewhere in the middle, but honestly, I'm not a huge Barrett fan. Oftentimes he never gives me that much of a reason to care, and it's only so often that he steps beyond that stereotypical eco-warrior Mr. T mode. Of all the characters in the game, he's certainly amongst the most inconsistent when it comes to writing. I don't know whether it's the translation or what, but he's the poster child for a POC character that constantly slips from being well-spoken one sentence and going into full-on ebonics the next. The first sign of someone not knowing what the fuck when it comes to writing people of colour. Also, in all honesty, even when we do get to his actual part of the story, it's really not all that interesting. So of all the playable characters there are, Barrett is probably third or second from bottom, but we'll get to that more later. Still, I can try and expand on the character's emotions and dark more, even if I don't always agree with a lot of it. I can at least see why he's particularly angry in Midgar, a lot of it certainly does come from his general anger about the state of the world, which you know we'll get to in a little while, but there's also the personal side as well. The most positive thing you can say about him is his utter devotion to Marlene, and how he would do absolutely anything for her. Parental figures, or the lack of parental figures, is another one of those themes that won through FF7, and Barrett is kinda unique in that you have a world where most of the main characters have lost their biological parents and are reliant on mother or father figures, but Barrett is actually a father figure to someone else, and you couldn't possibly deny him that. Really, more than the planet, his whole reason for what he does is that he wants Marlene to grow up in a better world than the one that he grew up in. I also tend to see a lot of his more outward displays of anger, or bullying, as pure fronting, trying to assert his place as leader in the face of opposition from Cloud. I'm thinking mainly about parts where he, say, randomly goes off on a Shinra employee on the train. As the one man in the group who has a very specific one, he's constantly trying to assert it, making sure that's secure. There are very good sides to Barrett as a character, his devotion to Marlene, the trust that he ends up placing in other people, or learning to do that, and his absolute code. He's loyal to the core, and will stick by anyone who does good by him to the ends of the earth. It's just that, you know, a lot of that goodwill struggles to shine when the default animation for his anger is him beating his freaking chest. 
Barrett ultimately settles into a rather passive role, as he never quite changes enough or has the progression you would want in a character you'd truly care about. And the more uncomfortable sides of his character are, well, uncomfortable. So he usually ends up on the sidelines when I play through the game, unfortunately. He's more prized for what he offers in combat, long range, heavy physical attacks and the like, than for what he actually brings to the story. But talking about Barrett does bring me to one of the game's core themes, the environment. Particularly in Midgar, FF7 is all about the preservation of the planet, its avalanche's reason for existence, and its Shinwa's too. One wants to save the planet's resources, the other wants to use them for personal gain and empire building. Mako is the planet's fossil fuel, indeed it's described as the planet's very lifeblood, and we use it all of the time. Materia is formed from Mako, the lifeblood of the planet formed into crystals that then refine themselves into something a person can use. Shinwa take this step to a whole new level, industrialising a process that is supposed to be natural. And we see this when we look at the world. Midgar is a grey, hopeless city that runs entirely on Mako that's had its natural process truncated for the purposes of using energy. We're skipping ahead a little here, but the world map itself and the cities of FF7 present a giant metaphor. Midgar itself is surrounded by desolate wasteland because there's quite simply no more energy to give there. Calm, the first town we come across, is comparatively bright and cheerful, but it's perilously close to Midgar, and one can see that soon enough it'll be swept up by Midgar and become a barren wasteland itself. As for any town in the game that's accepted Shinwa into their lives and agreed to have a Mako reactor built there, well the consequences for that are kinda severe. The further we get away from Midgar, the cleaner places tend to become, but the effects of what Shinwa's doing is still felt far and wide. After all, it's partly the reason why there's so many frickin' monsters milling around to boot. I can think of basically no other game that takes such a stance on the environment in the way that FF7 does. It's a massive, bold, pro-eco message. It's one of the things I love about the game, in fact. Too many games are kind of afraid to actually stand for something, you know? To convey a message. This is a game that's not, and it's one of the most famous games ever made. The message might perhaps become somewhat heavy-handed at times, but it's still kind of important, and I wish that more games would take directions like this one does. It wasn't just a case of including a pro-environmental message because it would sell the game, it's clearly something that meant a lot to the people who created the game, and we don't see enough of that in mainstream titles today. I could talk a lot about the more subtle pro-environmental messages in games like Sonic, at least back in the days of classic Sonic, but that's something that takes a lot of reading into rather than something that actually takes a stand. I guess you could say it's like the Oliver Stone or Spike Lee approach to making a film an in-game form, at least when they're at their peak, treading very close to a polemic but not quite tipping over the edge. Taking on such an approach means that you have to convey a lot of emotion, and a lot of that emotion is angry, and so you need something to focus that angle on, don't you? And in Midgar, you find it in the Shinwa Company. Throughout Midgar, they're positioned as the game's main antagonists. It's only at the very end when Finns take a turn and Sephiroth takes centre stage that they find themselves busted down the ranks somewhat. It's quite a powerful moment, actually, because in truth, Shinwa are ahead of you at almost every turn throughout Midgar. You didn't realise that they were perfectly capable of destroying an entire sector just to get back at you, indeed purely for the sake of public opinion. The hundreds of thousands of lives lost was worth it purely to have something negative that could be pinned on Avalanche. In the end, there wasn't even all that much hope of rescuing Iris. One gets the feeling that you were just allowed to fall around in Shinwa's HQ as much as you wanted until you got that little bit too close, at which point you were simply swept up. It's only by chance that you're not left to rot in the cells or publicly executed or whatever. But then, in one fell swoop, they're dead. The guy you've been conditioned to accept as the supervillain has a sword sticking out his belly. It was so much of a struggle for you, but for this unknown entity, it was effortless. It's at this point one realises that for all the bad things Shinwa's done to the planet, well it's nothing compared to what Sephiroth could potentially do. Still, Shinwa settle nicely into their role as supporting antagonists. They're not so front and centre as they're kind of after Sephiroth as well, but they're always around. After all, Sephiroth is kind of a consequence of Shinwa's actions. If it wasn't for them and all of their fucking around, none of this would have happened at all, would it? So how effective are they, really? 
Well, in the end, they function quite well. Although I do end up wishing, at least in Midgar, that they were a little bit more faceless. Some people do complain a lot more about FF7's handling of environmental issues being a bit too sledgehammer-esque, and I think a lot of that is down to President Shinwa being basically the most cliché, cigar-chomping, big boss character you could find. He's really not much of a character at all, in fact, and if he did end up being the game's main antagonist, well, it'd probably be a hell of a lot weaker as a result. It's a bit of a relief when he's replaced by Rufus, who is a lot more corporate, honest, and generally better as a character. He's not so shallow. The same can be said for a lot of the other Shinwa characters too. Hojo, Heidegger and the like. They're kinda silly, really. Still, Shinwa do have the Turks, and they play a rather strange role in the whole story. So much so, in fact, that we'll be looking at the Turks in more detail in another video. For now though, we've got to go to another character. With so many big characters introduced in the first part of the game, it's almost all we're doing. Although, this one, well, there's actually not a whole lot to say about them so far. It takes a while for Tifa to come into her own, although she does end up being perhaps the second or third most important character in our group, but that doesn't really happen until Disc 2, which is a freaking long way away. For now though, well, what do we know? We know she's Cloud's childhood friend, basically, and that somewhere along the line she started hanging out with Barrett and became a part of Avalanche. We don't even know why she joined up with them yet, aside from the usual stuff about protecting the planet and what have you. There's got to be something more than that, surely? And well, of course there is. Let's not forget that we see her in one of Cloud's earlier flashbacks with her dead father, shouting how she hates them all, how Sephiroth did this to her dad, picking up the sword to get revenge. It makes no sense whatsoever when you first see it, but when you reach the end of Midgar, well, it still doesn't make much sense, but if you think on it, then you wonder what she knows, and how much she's hiding. Because clearly she knows something about Sephiroth too, that's not all good. Her full name, Tifa Lockhart, is another clue. You know, that Phoenix Wright sort of thing where the name's all punny and says something about the character. She's got a locked heart and ought to get it seen to real quick. Tifa was one of the more complex characters in the game with a long arc, and we've barely seen any of it, so we'll be getting back to her. Okay, so moving on to another thing, um, let's talk about FF7's graphics. One of the things that tend to go against the game quite a bit these days. They are most definitely of their time. You get pre-rendered backgrounds for the characters to walk on, and the characters themselves are these tiny low-poly models. It could all seem like a bit of an illusion. If you removed the background, well, there'd be nothing but a black screen. A lot of games in the PS1 era used pre-rendered backgrounds, Resident Evil is another prominent example, but this game is where they really stick out, if only because of those models. They're chunky, they don't have proper hands, and they look a bit silly, you know? Although, I gotta say, to be honest, I don't know if it's just nostalgia talking or anything, but I find them cute and endearing. Honestly, they're like 3D versions of the sprites you'd get in 16-bit RPGs and the like. One other thing about the sprites is that they can and do make a lot of gestures. Say what you will, but there's a lot of animation here, with occasionally the most subtle differences here and there between one character's nod and another. That sort of detail. When writing the script for FF7, Kazushige Nojima and Yoshinori Kitase said they were going for extreme realism. And a little bit of that does get lost in the translation, granted, which we'll get to properly in another part, but the gestures do a lot to fill in the blanks and convey the emotions they want to portray without simply relying on words. The flashback to when Elmira finds Iris at the train station is pretty much entirely made by those little animations, and well, when we get to the most famous moment of the entire game, we'll see some beautiful examples. These little blocky things emote a hell of a lot, and it's always welcome. To be honest, it feels like a bit of a lost art. There's too much reliance on realistic models or voice acting or things like that these days. People make characters that are lifelike and then a lot of the time they don't really do anything with them. The models in Final Fantasy VIII might have looked better, they might have been realistically proportioned, but they had a lot less charm too. And no, I would never want to replace these blocky models with the ones you see in the battle scenes, as good as they are. They just fit the world that little bit better. And as for those pre-rendered backgrounds, again, that's another lost art. There's some truly wonderful detail in a lot of places in Midgar. When you get out of the first reactor, the floors of Shinwa HQ, Iris's home, and especially the wall market, 
Again, there's a great commitment to some things that aren't even all that necessary, but give life to what could just be a static picture. No game quite used pre-rendered backgrounds like this one did. The best moments of the game are like walking through a painting. I wish more games would just give themselves over to artistic license the way this one does. There are some legitimately excellent graphics in FF7. The aforementioned battle scene models are still great, as are the battle scenes in general, and the game had fantastic CGI cutscenes for the time, with seamless transitions between pre-rendered graphics and full motion video. But weirdly, it's the things that date the game the most that I really cherish about it. If only because you just don't quite see a lot of stuff like it anymore, and you wish someone would go ahead and win that back. The 16-bit RPG is quite well represented when it comes to people still making games in that style, but if only some people were willing to bat for the 32-bit style as well, you know? I mean, of course, that's probably asking for way too much when it comes to indies, but you never know. Someone must be crazy enough to attempt a game like this. Surely. And finally in this video, we have one more character to look at. Possibly, in fact, my favourite character in the whole game. A little while into Midgar, we get introduced properly to a flower girl from the slums who we saw in the first screen of the game, Iris Gainsborough. For whatever reason, the sheer coincidence of Cloud falling through a church roof just as the Turks were getting ready to capture her, not to mention simple bloody-mindedness, she decides to come along. Someone who appears to be every bit a normal girl, although of course, that wasn't really going to last now, was it? As we know, she's the last surviving ancient. We don't know much about the Ancients, but Shinwa believes that Iris can lead them to a place called the Promised Land, and so they want her for themselves. It seems like a good setup for a proper damsel in, doesn't it? And to be honest, well, you get that a lot in Midgar. We do end up going to Shinwa HQ to save Iris after all. She is kind of in part, in Midgar at least, a stereotypical damsel in distress. But there are some details that do make things a little different, like how she wasn't just captured, but that she actually offered herself to the Shinwa instead of Marlene, Barrett's daughter. Kind of makes you wonder if she actually had a bit of a plan all along. She's certainly the most relatable of all the characters though, because, well, she's so normal. One of the best moments I find in her characterisation is right at the beginning. She breaks up laughing when Cloud says he'll do almost anything. She's clearly caring, thoughtful, and independent, and the whole scene might be this angelic sort of place in a way, but that doesn't stop her from having a dirty sense of humour. And this is before she gets the idea to stick Cloud into a dress. The general normalcy of Iris is something that kind of gets lost a little in the whole extended universe, where she so often becomes this weird, ethereal thing. Her being the last of the ancients defines her, as do all the cliches that go with that. There is a bit more to her though, and as far as personality goes, well she might just be the best realised character in the whole game. The rest of this one will also, you know, well let's just say that Iris will certainly stop being any kind of typical damsel in distress. In fact, she's going to become the exact opposite. But that's all to come. For now though, we must stop with the analysis. But with all of that done, we're basically fully up to date on everything that's happened so far, and then some. And later on, perhaps we won't have to cover so much all at once. The next video is going to look at the rest of this one. Big flashbacks, bigger cannons, lots of fun and games, prisons, clones, a load more new characters, chasing the man with the black cape, and perhaps the most famous moment in RPG history. All of that's to come. For now though, it's time to end this video. Thanks for watching, and wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.